Yes, you can start. So uh, thank you everyone for joining in and uh, uh, thank you BOTRD and uh, Patmesh for allowing me to do the session. I mean, we've been looking to connect with a lot of people outside uh, the main uh, conservation network to reach out to people and talk more about uh, the bears and just Ladakh as a landscape, for example. Um, so um, some of you guys have been to Ladakh. Many of you have just heard of Ladakh. Uh, when you talk about the landscape and the uh, flora fauna of it, we know about the snow leopard, which is the most iconic species of the landscape. Uh, so this is the top predator of the region. And um, frankly, uh, sort of uh, a keystone species. Apart from the snow leopard, we also have the Himalayan brown bear. And now this is the largest uh, land predator in this region. And unfortunately, not many people know of Himalayan brown bear. Um, so why I say that? Because I have interacted with a lot of people. I've been working on this project for over three years. And uh, being in Zanskar, I meet a lot of people, solo trekkers, uh, trekking alpine style and all that. A lot of people trek in the bear habitat. And after speaking to them, um, I realized that not many people knew they were trekking in the brown bear habitat. In fact, a lot of people didn't even know there were brown bears that we find in India. So, yes, I left that thought there. And then now we know we are stuck in lockdown and we do what we can. So I just thought, uh, let me just take up a small survey. So what I did was... Um, I did this uh, small quiz on WhatsApp, and what I did was I sent 20 uh, people in my contact list this particular quiz and asked them to send it to 10 more people of there. So we had a rough number of 2,200 people who, ha who took up this um, uh, fun test. Obviously, which of the above animal is not found in India? A, B, C, D. So... Uh, when I got the response from these 200 people, it was, um, I knew what the response would have been, but this was a bit shocking. The person, 88% of the people actually said, C is not found in India. Whereas 12% of people just said, okay, they were spot on B, B, which is the mountain lion found in the American continent. Um, so, yeah, that gave an indication. Obviously, this is not like a structured research, and you know? this is just something I did uh, for fun on the side, uh, which is why we thought that this, it's very important to network, reach out to people who are not in that region or not related to, you know, not basically have some interest in wildlife, but need to know more about what's happening. India, as you know, is a sort of tiger obsessed country, and we, everyone knows tiger. But brown bear, no. So 88% of the people who said C, not found in India, they actually referred this animal to the grizzly bear of the Northern American region. So, well, we can't blame them because we already know the Hollywood has showcased a big brown bear's grizzly bear and people are sort of, you know, associating bears the movies like The Edge, Grizzly Man, Grizzly Maze, and things like that. So there was immediate association of uh, that brown bear to grizzly bear, and thus leading to the idea that, you know, they're not found in India. Um, again, it doesn't help when the movies like these uh, portray the, the animals which are not, not really found in this landscape. Jungle Book, the old Jungle Book actually shows uh, what seems like an American black bear and the new 3D jungle book shows the brown bear. And most of us know that Indian subcontinent, um, the, the, the forest of central India do not have these both bear species. They have actually the sloth bear. So basically our assumption, our understanding of animals comes from what information we've been fed in. So I thought this is a great opportunity to talk and uh, interact with you guys. And I'm just going to keep this presentation a little light and uh, not technical so everyone can sort of uh, uh, enjoy. Uh, this is the technical part, sorry. <laughs> so to understand how the bears evolved, and we probably have to go 40 million years ago when the, the carnivore group, once one group of uh, species sort of uh, moved out, to form uh, the 
the RSD and uh, price uh, the the prosonid species. The prosonid will made sort of the diverge into current present day raccoon and panda. The RSD uh, sort of moved on to the current bears. About 20, 25 million years ago, the bears uh, diverged, the, 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 the giant panda sort of moved away from the bear species, the main ursid species. It's still an ursid, but uh, uh, their evolution went on. And today we have the top eight bear species on this planet, where the giant panda happens to be quite different than the rest of the seven species because it's sort of separated itself 20 to 25 million years ago. And uh, if you see this timeline, um, uh, pretty much after 20 million years ago, a lot of these uh, bear species started uh, sort of forming. There were a lot of in-between species, which are now are probably extinct, like the cave bears and things like that, or the short-faced bear, which was the largest bear uh, ever to roam. And if you see about uh, very recently, polar bears, sort of separated out from the bears, the, from the brown bear uh, lineage and made their own appearance on this uh, planet. So well, again, when exactly did this separate out? There are a lot of debates about it, as in, okay, some people said four, about four or five million years ago. So whatever, it's it's quite recent compared to the entire journey of the bears. So some some theory says that about seven million years ago, the the, the polar bears separated from the brown bears and sort of came back again together and sort of uh, uh, sort of had a hybrid and then again separated out. But um, so we don't have a clear bearing on that right now, or at least I don't have the clear bearing on. That. But then currently now these are two distinct species. But considering the eight species on on this planet, polar bears and the brown bears are the most closely related. And more about the bears, we know that uh, uh, the bears are omnivores, and uh, and uh, if you just see the entire spectrum, there is this one end of the spectrum, which is the polar bear, and the other end being the panda bear. Oh, it's a giant panda, sorry. Uh, all bears are omnivores, uh, but in this particular scenario, the polar bear seems to be primarily carnivorous and the giant panda is primarily herbivorous. So what, what I mean by that, their main diet is, so for example, the polar bear, we know they, they, they sort of hunt seals and marine animals, but they also feed on uh, some sort of marine algae, algae and, uh, and uh, seeds of uh, lime uh, grass. Uh, so one of the study uh, carried out in Huston, Hudson Bay, uh, they found uh, these seeds and uh, residual of uh, the marine algae in polar bear scat food. And giant panda, definitely they're quite slow, so they can't really hunt uh, as well, but they are known to feed on insects and eggs. So what does that leave the brown bear as? So is, is, is that, uh, so we can tend to think, is the brown bear the intermediary? Like, is it like a perfect omnivore? And uh, there are quite a lot of studies done across the world to understand the bear diet. And uh, there's a lot of interesting things that's going on in uh, brown bear diet. Uh, but before that, let's understand how these guys uh, evolved. I mean, when they separated out, the closest relative polar bears and the brown bears, when they separated about, say, four or five million years ago. Now, if you see the adaptation, the skull adaptation, if you see polar bear, brown bear, and giant bear, we see distinct uh, shape of their uh, dental structure. To start with, uh, uh, the premolars. Now, premolars are the teeth which are just after the ca the canine and before the main molars. These are used for grinding. If you see in polar bears, the premolars are absent. They're just not there because of the diet. And there was no need for them to be uh, having any premolars to grind. Um, brown bears have a sort of fading premolars, and giant panda has well-defined premolars. That says a lot about their eating habit and uh, adaptation based on uh, the diet and what was available out there for them to eat. 
Now, you see that canines as well. The polar bears have got more prominent structured canine brown bear as well. And the giant panda, of course, the skull is small, but in relation, if you see the canine, it's, it's quite sure small compared to the other bears. So this weighted uh, beautiful adaptation of one species that broke off from the carnivora group and they just became so specialized, polar bear into the uh, sort of uh, frozen Arctic area and the panda into the, the thickly vegetated landscape. Uh, again, this picture says uh, shows you more in detail about the, how, how the molars are in between the brown bear and giant panda. You see these fading molars, premolars, but in giant panda, they're still quite defined. In, I wouldn't say still quite even. They were actually developed much later to uh, support their um, uh, sort of eating habit. So when I uh, place the brown bear in between uh, the, uh, the polar bear and the giant panda, we will lighten some other perfect omnivore. And uh, like I said, there are a lot of research that's been already carried out on diet of the bears. Um, so this is what is, uh, this is very interesting. Again, the brown bears, depending on where they are, they are perfectly adapted to what's available. So they're called the opportunistic feeders. So they make use of what is available to them. So uh, to tell you how that happens, so you just see that brown bears come in very like very different sizes. Like you can have brown bears, full grow, fully matured males, standing up to five feet, to something that goes eight point five to nine feet. Now that 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 height comes very close to polar bear. Now what is the what contributes to the size difference? It's a diet. So for example, uh, the bears that feed primarily on uh, say uh, meat. Okay, there was a study conducted by Garth uh, in, uh, yeah, so in uh, to understand what the coastal bears eat. Now, this is a, a map of Alaska, and then they looked at the bears, bear population, which is around the coast, primarily the area which is near the Kodiak Islands. Okay, 60 to 100 percent of their diet consumed was 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 made up of salmon which is meat primarily and it's it's interesting to find out now that's kodiak island around here well marked the largest largest of brown bears are found in kodiak island right so the what they eat has got direct contribution to the size and uh, so we, we we had bears all across uh, the globe. Uh, the the pale green marking shows where the bears used to be found, and then slowly, because of uh, habitat destruction or, or changing climate, uh, the 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 range of these bears reduced. And uh, we know the bears are opportunistic feeders, and if if a particular food source is sort of disappearing. They can quickly adapt to another food source. But if there's human population extending into the bear territory, then there is no scope for the bears to actually come out and explore new options. So it's not just the disappearance of their diet, their food, but also uh, uh, the range uh, and, and, and growth, uh, sort of uh, pressure of uh, human civilization. That's a picture of the largest uh, Kodiak bear, and I don't know if some any, any of you have heard of the of uh, this bear, Bart the bear. It's, a, it's known to be a very popular bear because uh, it's it's bred in captivity. It's again part of uh, it's it's a Alaskan coastal bear, and this bear was trained to act in films and a lot of movies like The Edge and uh, 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 the the Grizzly Maze. This may bear featured in those. Even Game of Thrones, there was a fight sequence one in one of the episodes, but the bear uh, featured in that. This is a very large bear and was primarily fed on meat diet. Um, so, so that gives an idea how big brown bears can be. And they, they are, it's said they can be as big as a polar bear. So if you say um, the largest Kodiak, Kodiak bear ever to be found 
was about uh, about 8.5 to 9 feet. And uh, that's the general size of uh, a polar bear. But polar bears actually can grow uh, bigger than that. So the largest polar bear found was uh, about 10, 10.5 feet, I, I guess. Uh, but even if the variation in length changes, the, the Kodiak bears on and off were found to be more heavier than the brown, uh, than the, uh, sorry, the Kodak bears were, were heavier than the brown bears. So that's generally, uh, you know, bears around the world. And um, then we look at the subspecies. Apart from the eight bear species, one of them is the brown bear. And the brown bear now has got 16 known subspecies. The Himalayan brown bear, that's that's uh, that's the species found on the Indian subcontinent. Uh, and it starts, maybe we can find a Himalayan brown bear in Afghanistan, uh, northern Pakistan, India, Nepal. Uh, uh, I'm not sure about uh, Bhutan uh, uh, because it said there have not been any uh, recent records of brown bears from Bhutan. So it's presumably, presumably, presumably <laughs> extinct in Bhutan. So that's that. And uh, of course, Tibet, but that's uh, the Tibetan blue bear. Um, yeah, these are the eight. So from the eight, these are the four bear species found in India. The, the brown bear, which we will, uh, which is sometimes called the red bear or the Himalayan brown bear. The, the Latin name is Ursus arctis isabellinus. Then we have the Asiatic black bear. Then you have the sloth bear and the sun bear. In India, the bear, uh, so Himalayan brown bears are found uh, in the, the upper Kashmir region, the Union Territory of Ladakh, uh, especially Kargil district and Zanskar district. That's where I work. I will talk more about uh, Zanskar and my observations about the bear, which is why the title of the presentation is, or the talk is, the Fascinating Bears of Ladakh. Uh, I'll tell you why I find them fascinating. Apart from uh, the Union Territory of Ladakh, uh, we move southwards uh, the 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 state Himalayan state of uh, Himachal Pradesh has got good uh, bear brown bear population. Uh, I I don't know when what I mean by when I say good brown bear population. We are yet to arrive at consensus as in what is a good population. But Dr. Uh, Bipin Rathod has been working in Himachal, especially the Pir Panjal range. And I have been following his work and there seems to be a lot of uh, good uh, breeding populations of Himalayan brown bear around that area. Then in state of Uttarakhand, which is neighboring state of uh, uh, next to Himachal, we have brown bears there. And uh, there have been some records of brown bears in northeastern region, uh, Sikkim. That's that. So about Himalayan brown bears, they are they're just like brown bears. They they are probably active from spring to autumn. I will explain why I said I'm probably active. Um, spring to autumn, uh, because after autumn, they sort of uh, get into hibernation. These bears, uh, these are the only, uh, this and the Himalayan black bear, Asiatic black bear, or also called the Himalayan black bear, hibernate. The sloth bears do not. Um, and uh, sun bears, I think, do not as well. So I'm not sure about the sun bears because I haven't really uh, studied them. But brown bears definitely hibernate. And uh, now that's a picture of one of the possible den sites. Uh, brown bears prefer to uh, sort of choose natural site, dense site, which is far away from human habitation. They are very, very sensitive to human disturbance. And, um, okay, so we haven't really carried out a lot of studies on Himalayan brown bears in India, but now I will base uh, certain studies that were carried out on bears in Europe. So there's one particular study that uh, actually proves that uh, if there has been a disturbance, even like in a one and a half to two kilometers distance of the dense site, the bears actually abandon the dense site and move much further away, as as, as further away as possible from human habitation. Um, so, so that's that. And then, so 
if they do uh, hibernate uh, in winters and they come out early spring, spring, and uh, it, again start uh, they 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 start mating. They they mate in summers. The gestation period of a female bear is about 180 to 250 days, and uh, they obviously give birth while hibernating in the den site. So when they give birth and take care of the young uh, in winters while hibernating, so that, that sort of uh, uh, puts all the researchers a little off the uh, consensus of hibernation. So again, if you search for hibernating bears, there are a lot of theories and agreements and sort of disagreements and what is hibernation. So people have come to sort of basic understanding, okay, there are true hibernators and there are uh, sort of uh, in uh, bear animals or mammals that are reptiles which are sort of inactive for a period. So true hibernator, what, uh, what does true hibernation mean? It's uh, according to one study, a true hibernation is when uh, when uh, 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 animal, be it a mammal or uh, an insect or a reptile species, sort of uh, uh, sort of goes completely inanimate. Uh, for example, something like a uh, yeah, bumblebee. Uh, now, if you're in a true inanimate say, state, like a true hibernation hibernation state, your heart rate, or the heart rate of the species should probably go uh, less than 10 beats per minute. In case of the brown bears, uh, general understanding is that the heart rate of a hibernating bear is about 15 beats per minute, or 15, 16 beats per minute. Uh, which means uh, it's not truly uh, hybrid into deep hibernation, which which makes sense because if the females have to nurse the young, they have to be active and to be able to move around. Also, if there is a threat to them, uh, they need to be active. They need to be mobile. But if your heart rate is below 10 beats per minute, it is very difficult for that particular animal species to move. So, or... Uh, um, uh, in the case of Arctic ground squirrels, they they their I think their heart rate goes down to six beats per minute. But and so yeah, bumblebee goes even like three to four beats per minute. Um, so that's true hibernation, and uh, brown bear maybe not. But yes, we we try to term that as a denning phase of the brown bears. Also, yeah, because of global warming and. Uh, and a uh, lot of other reasons, uh, a lot of people have seen uh, a drastic change in uh, the, the pattern of hibernation or denning seasons of the bear. The bear seems to be going into the dens pretty late and uh, coming out uh, of the hibernation, the hibernating state or the denning state much earlier. In fact, uh, uh, in Zanskar this year, also in Dras, people have reported uh, to see uh, bears out and about in winter. So that's that's another concern out there as in what's happening to these bears. Uh, <clears throat> but we'll get to that. Now. But this is this is global phenomenon, anyways. A lot of bears have been seen uh, out and about in winters, not true hibernators. <clears throat> Hemel and brown bear now. now this species uh, is, is, is still considered the least studied species. Um, by that, we don't mean there are not many studies carried out. Uh, we just uh, sort of mean that, I mean, if you compare to another sort of uh, uh, iconic species like a tiger, amount of uh, studies carried out to understand tiger, uh, thing that's been done for the bears. There are a handful of studies out there on the Hindu, uh, on the Himalayan brown bear, uh, but one of the most extensive study, in fact, two of the most extensive studies uh, we we would refer to is one from uh, one by Dr. Ali Nawaz in Deosai National Park, and the other one in Himachal, Dr. Bipin Rathod, and he's been studying bears for quite some time. Um, um, uh, sorry, uh, just a minute, uh, Prathamish. There are a lot of messages coming in. Do you, do I need to check those messages on WhatsApp? No, 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 nothing, nothing. We can just ignore all, right. all of it. We'll take all care right. of it. Cool. 
Cool, cool. Thanks, man. Uh, is everyone able to hear me properly? Uh, yeah, actually, it's crystal clear. Oh, great. Uh, brilliant. Uh, so now, um, like I said, uh, there are only a handful of studies carried out on brown bears. And, uh, and, uh, and there, is, there is a bit of, uh, uh, I wouldn't say concern, but uh, uh, there's a need to understand that uh, uh, these bears are very diverse and adapted to very different landscape. Now, this picture is from uh, uh, Deosai National Park by Dr. Ali Nawaz. It's the purpose of this picture is to show, uh, even if you call brown bears, now you could probably see different morphs. You could probably see like deep brown, which almost goes to black, to, uh, to a golden brown, almost looking yellow, to uh, the picture on the top uh, left. So I might be wrong, uh, but... Uh, you know, it sort of goes close to grizzly. Why grizzly bears are called grizzly and not just brown bears? Because uh, they're brown, the coat is brown, but to the tip of their fur uh, has got much brighter t yellow tinge, which is like a grizzled effect. And so this also sort of, no, not so much as grizzly, but it's a, so I'm trying to say it's about so many variation uh, in the, the color pattern, in the coat pattern, the colors and things like that. Also look at the landscape that they're uh, found. Now, according to the study here by Dr. Navas, alpine meadows are the best habitat for the brown bear. Okay, And uh, the gradient, preferred gradient, or the most suitable gradient for the brown bears is rolling hills to flat meadows or flat plateaus. That's more appropriate. For the Himalayas. Um, so, also because uh, these rolling hills and flat meadows uh, offer them the much needed nutrition, and uh, like I said, uh, these these animals are that, and they sort of eat what is available here. And the diet analysis of the brown bear, the Himalayan brown bear in Deosai National Park. Now, how they did this diet analysis is by uh, sort of uh, collecting scat. Uh, if everyone understands what scat, scat is a bear poop, uh, not just bear poop, any animal's poop. And uh, sort of they you sort of study that uh, scat sample and find out what was the matter consumed by the bear. So 93% of all the cats were plant species. And uh, similar study by Dr. Bipin Rathod. And now he shows this perfect habitat of the Himalayan brown bear. Uh, with the rhododendron uh, uh, plants and uh, and the vegetation on the alpine meadow. Again, the and a diet analysis uh, at Kukti National Park shows 80% of that diet consistent of the plant material. Uh, so if I have to take you back, you know, we, 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 know, we, we just looked at Kodiak bear, where about 80% of that diet is... Uh, Sorry, 60 to 100 percent of the diet is salmon, and they are massive, huge, going almost as big as uh, the polar bear. And um, we have the Himalayan brown bear, where the diet is about 80 percent plant material, and then these bears are not as big as their the European cousins. They are much smaller. Now, this needs further, in, obviously, needs further investigation, as in. Uh, do we do we really establish this that the the food that the brown bears consume the determines the size or is it also the landscape that they live in determines it? But there is there seems to be a general scientific consensus on this as well that uh, the, the inclusion of meat affects the bear's size and hence it's affecting its reproductive success rate as well. So uh, Scandinavian bears uh, are known to be highly reproductive, uh, uh, but when you talk about the Himalayan brown bear, uh, are supposed to be uh, not as efficient uh, reproducers. Okay? The, the energy consumption, the, the apparent investment is too high and uh, the, the resource spent in living in the landscape, the energy and resource spent uh, in this landscape is just too high. But while we look at this 
gradient of landscape. This is where a lot of studies have been carried out. And, uh, and we are trying to uh, set out one baseline for the bears. But that gets a little tricky because we know brown bears would prefer a habitat which is like this, lush green alpine meadows. But here in Zanskar, we have trans, we, these bears are living in trans Himalayan region, dry, arid, steep, uh, rugged terrain, right? And, and, and we believe that they're also quite well adapted to a region like this. In fact, uh, they're not just surviving here, they're breeding. Um, uh, I, I would dare to use uh, the term efficiently. Uh, I will explain that uh, going further. So if you look at this landscape, uh, where the vegetation is scarce, yes, but just about enough for the bears to uh, sort of survive. And we haven't carried out any um, uh, diet analysis of the bears right now here, but general assumption again here is that uh, these bears primarily feed on the plant material and uh, for for their protein intake, they 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 uh, sort of hunt marmots. Marmots are the large rodents uh, that live in this landscape. They're burrowing animals, so um, it's and brown bears are excellent uh, at digging, and because they one of part of their diet is also roots and shoots, so they dig the uh, the ground and they can grow, uh, bur dig out the burrowing marmots and feed on them. So what uh, it would be interesting to find out how much of uh, marmots are being consumed by the bears in Zanskar. But uh, yeah, general understanding is they are probably uh, sort of feeding on uh, plant species. So what I was trying to get at is um, uh, these wonderful, amazing animals are found in such varied habitats, right from you know, lush green valleys to uh, you know, trans Himalayan dry, arid, rugged landscape to uh, you know the coastal region of Alaska. So there is clearly a spatial temporal variation in brown bears in, in terms of their diet, their behavior, things like that. When I say spatial temporal, for people who do not understand, spatial temporal variation is a variation based on space and time. Space meaning what? season and temporal what time so that's that's pretty so uh, this this is like a snapshot of the bears uh in uh, in in zanskar there is uh, sparse vegetation you can find that and then uh this th we've uh, seen this bear for quite some time and then uh, saw it extensively feeding on one particular plant species which is the wild gram uh sister microphyllium uh, it's also found abundantly in this valley, and the bears seem to like yeah. that. Okay, someone's. Uh, okay. So, if you see, um, uh, now this is a snapshot of uh, or one of the valleys that uh, we ventured into to uh, sort of find out if there is a bear presence or not. So, look how rugged the landscape is, and the uh, like, of minimal vegetation and uh, something that most of the research uh, indicates that this is not this is not going to be a preferred landscape. But when uh, so the, to tell you this is only like about twenty five percent of the entire valley that we ventured into in two thousand eighteen, trying to reach to one particular village. So it was harsh. It was very difficult. There was no clear trail. Uh, uh, so we can see the yellow mark trail. That's that. That's the that's the bottom ridge tra trail we took to get inside the valley, walking along the riverbed. Primarily because uh, bears are known to frequent water sources, and they would be found zero to five hundred meters from a source of water. So we wanted to see if that's that's true. And then uh, while going into this valley. They saw a lot of signs of a bear's cat and uh, track signs. To, and to come out of the valley, we took the top ridge route, and that, that blue line shows how we came out. Now, a day, in one day, walking into this valley, 
I saw five bears. Of that, there were two mother, mother and cubs and one single lone bear. So that's a clear, clear indication. There's a good. Uh, there's the bears are breeding here, and they're 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 raising the offspring as well. So that's a good sign, and then sort of tells out to other researchers if they would like to carry out some more uh, study in this region. Yeah. So, you know, so trans Himalaya is something that they probably should not ignore, thinking that it's not a prime bear habitat. Um, yeah. So this is again. Uh, to the same valley when we were working. Well, I was on the opposite side of this uh, valley and there's mother and cub. I don't know if you can see. I've purposely put up a long shot to give you a feel of the entire uh, landscape. Now, this is a very steep terrain, although they're traversing uh, horizontally. Uh, if you see the trace, the trace of the water, uh, uh, it's, there's no water you can see, but you can see how the water has trickled down. It tells you it's a quite steep terrain, and there's a mother and cub just traversing across this landscape. Okay, and uh, so habitat use of these bears is also so diverse. And uh, most often, what we would write off saying that maybe this is not uh, where the bears would uh, prefer to be, but uh, a very good chance of finding them. Now, again, uh, another mother and cub. You know, walking up the slope um, the, in the same valley. The, that's 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 again a sparsely vegetated landscape and a very gradual slope, but that's an altitude of 4,300 meters. And uh, that's, uh, if you can see on your screen, that's a big full grown, uh, possibly male bear. Uh, obviously, I was far, so I can't tell you for for sure it's a male or female. But judging by the size of it, well, we think it's a male bear. Males are much larger than females, so uh, so that, in my opinion, should be a male bear. I saw it for a very long time. Now, what it's doing? It's 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 um, it's feeding on this very particular plant species, uh, the wild rose. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, called it's, it's Rosa vapiana, and very important species, plant species. Uh, grow it, it grows in high altitude region. Uh, what I have observed the the flowering season of this uh, particular plant uh, is 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 sort of a little different compared to Leh district, and if I compare to Suru Valley, which is nearing to Zanskar and Zanskar, it's it sort of late, uh, blooms late in Zanskar, or so was my observation. I need to investigate this further, but there's something very interesting I found out about this particular plant. I'm gonna tell you that uh, in a minute. So, but if you see this, uh, well, it's, it's a wild rose as you, as, as, she, as the name says, it's a flower, but after the bloom, blooming of the flower, and it's, the, there's this bud that forms, and it has like a little sweetish uh, pungent taste. It's full of a lot of seeds. Um, I, I, we can eat it as well. I can see a lot of local people eating it. And um, and bears primarily feed on this. Uh, sorry to use the word primarily, but yes, they do feed on this. So unless we prove it in a very scientific study, uh, in a manner of a scientific study, I can't say primarily feed. But yes, uh, if you are out there in these valleys in autumn, so, so beginning autumn to winter, you're going to find a brown bear cat poop, which is colored like this, bright orange to red. And that happens when they extensively feed on these rose buds. So when we are trying to go look for the brown bear signs, to me personally, I would always go in autumn because it's so easy to find the brown bear cat uh, from a distance because it's just going to look like this stand out in the landscape. It's going to be like this moist uh, pile of dung. I'm sorry if someone's squeamish looking at the dung, but I'm uh, sorry, this is one of the very important things when you study an animal, the animal dung and its drag signs. These are the two things you need to understand before you uh, go in the field. So yeah, that's, that's that. And uh, and uh, so I, was go I, I said I, well, I had to tell you something very interesting about... Um, this plant species. So, um, <clears throat> so it starts blooming somewhere uh, in summertime, 
and these buds are uh, they they sort of are formed ripe in autumn, uh, mid-autumn types, and that's when the bears feed on. Now, on the, I don't know about, so like I said, we haven't carried out a lot of studies on brown bears, uh, the Himalayan brown bears in this region, but the general understanding of brown bear feeding habit is that when the bears come out of your hibernation, say that's uh, early spring, they, they consume about, uh, about 9,000 kilocalories a day. But when they are about to get into hibernation, so right, uh, the, right in the onset of autumn, mid-autumn, the consumption calorie intake goes down to 20,000 kilocalories, more than double. So they have to consume all that they can. So this becomes, because of the blooming time of this particular species in Zanskar, I would not even talk about uh, this species in uh, Suru Valley and Dras and Kargil because I don't know how that uh, blooming period works, but I can just talk about Zanskar where I uh, sort of work. It sort of lines up very beautifully for them to get that extra nutrients and extra calories. So while... I've, I've made a note that this uh, scat was photographed in autumn, mid-autumn, where the bear has actually fed on these uh, rose buds. And uh, that's, that's evident that we know. The following year, I went early spring. And, and yes, there is no wild, uh, wild rose. And uh, it was completely off my mind. I was not even thinking about these. And uh, I was looking for signs of bears and uh, and in one of the valleys, suddenly I saw a, a, a fresh cat, which looked like this. And, and that made me think, oh, now how is that possible? This is spring. Then I obviously started looking for the, uh, the rose of a beyond or the wild rose buds. And I saw there were quite a few plants which still had those buds on. So what probably would happen is they bloomed uh, uh, some plants or maybe uh, uh, these, these, uh, the 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 ripe bud lasted through the entire autumn, made it through the winter, and they were available in spring for the bears to feed on. Again, this is, I would like to re repeat, this is just my observation in one season. To be able to say something for sure, I have got to sort of uh, go back and study this more. There's more investigation needed, but this is what something, uh, this is what sort of excited me. And maybe I would like to give it out as a tease to people who would like to sort of come and do these kind of studies out there in this region. So that's, that's uh, one of the fascinating findings for me. Another wild, uh, another plant species that, that is very interesting is this wild carrot that grows only in Zanskar. Now, when I say only in Zanskar, because um, we have collected samples and we have shown it to people and in Kargil, which is the neighboring district, we have shown it to people in Leh district, and no one has seen this plant species grow in that region at all. It's just found in Zanskar. And, and why I am mentioning this is because now, uh, let me just pull up a map of Zanskar. Now, this is a map of Zanskar and uh, uh, region. Now, this is uh, the okay. valley. I think yeah. the screen is black. Uh, oh, okay. I, it shows, so, it shares uh, only one screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to stop this and probably open that. Uh, okay, no, so I'll just continue with this for now. Yeah. No, just so that I don't break the flow. So there, uh, there is a region. Of, there are three main valleys in Zanskar: the Stod Valley, the Lugnak Valley, and the Sham Valley. Now, what's interesting is uh, the Stod Valley has got the highest amount of uh, incidence of brown bear presence. Brown bears coming into the village and sort of uh, uh, attacking the granaries and uh, livestock enclosure and things like that. And not so much in Lugnok Valley and Sham Valley. Then we're trying to relate this. Uh, Stort Valley has high concentration of wild carrots growing in these fields. Now, this is not a crop. This is uh, is it's like a wild fodder that just grows on its own. 
and, and, and bears have been specifically targeted this. Now, uh, again, I will write to refer back to a study done by Dr. Bethan Rathod in uh, Himachal. Now, he, according to him, the bar brown bears come into the farmland and uh, the agricultural land, and they are actually just targeting buckwheat, a type of buckwheat, very specific. But in here, they are actually feeding primarily on wild carrots. Um, the image on the right is not very really clear, but usually this is what we see on the ground. When bears have come into the village at night, and they have spent most of the time digging for wild carrots. While they do, because this is not part of the major main crop that they grow, which is barley or peas at times, this is on the periphery of the agricultural land. It ha there has not been any case of uh, crop depredation. There is no loss to uh, crops reported by these villagers. I'll come to uh, sort of explain more about what the bears do when they come into the village, but that was another interesting find. And I would like to again tease out this idea to all the, some of the researchers who would like to study bears, look at maybe would like to explore one of uh, this uh, angle. Is that a relationship between the brown bears and the wild carrot growing in this particular region? So that's that. Uh, going back to brown bear poop, uh, when the bears uh, don't feed on the Rosa Vabiana, that, uh, that uh, beautiful uh, bright uh, color rosebud, the poop would probably look like this, where they have, they have been feeding a lot of grass and tubers and things like that. So it's a big pile of dung, and uh, yeah, you, you can't mistake it for anything else. It's like a bear poop. Also, if you got sort of uh, sort of <clears throat> uh, uh, trying to look what's <laughs> I know. Don't be squirmish when I say. It. Try to sort of see what's in there with a stale thing. You'll just see a lot of plant materials and things like that in there, grass and uh, things like those. So yeah, so. Uh, we think they are primarily feeding on uh, plant material, but they do uh, scavenge on uh, dead animals, and um, uh, they dig out marmots as well. Um, so that's that's something that we'd like to investigate further. My main study now. Uh, this is where this that fascination of the bears coming. I mean, why are these bears the way they are? So. At one hand, we know brown bears are known to be staying away from human habitation and any sort of human contacts compared to uh, the rest of the bear species. But there is also this fact that the bears are in Zanskar are coming into the village looking for food. And uh, so much so, they are trying to break into the homes of people here. Now, these photos tell you now uh, the bears try to break into the wall uh, so the windows are broken, shattered, and the wire mesh has been taken out, and they enter the homes in search of food. Now, the, the picture on the right side, you can see the claw mark. I, um, um, so this picture is a close-up shot, but if I sort of had the actual zoom-out shot, this is way about six and a half feet in height. This is about the door frame. So they have somehow attempted to climb a flat wall or either they are really six, they're probably more definitely, they are male bear is definitely five and a half, six feet tall to get to that height. Uh, but uh, excellent climbers trying to climb a flat wall to get into the house, break into the house. That's another interesting photo. Um, if you see the red marking on that particular wall, so what happened was the bear came uh, in this I mean, in the previous season, it probably broke the glass pane. And so the local people, they just put up iron rods and then there's a wire mesh. So the bear came back and uh, it tried to get inside the house through the window. You can see the wire mesh has been torn out. And uh, it, obviously the iron rod stopped it, from, uh, stopped it from going inside. But then it found one soft spot in the wall, probably a loose rock and it started taking all the rocks out. So this uh, red marked area is where the bear sort of moved out all the rocks, went in, inside the house and sort of 
ate what was in the kitchen store and then ran away. So uh, bears are uh, quite interesting. Now uh, you can see this another picture. Uh, they, I think they, they sort of investigate these homes of people and monasteries. This is a photo of a monastery, a big monastery. And uh, it found a soft spot close to the stairs to the wall. It probably found one patch, patch of uh, sort of uh, mud coming out and then started digging to sort of make its way uh, inside the monastery. And I don't know if you can see, there's a claw mark around here. So very persistent, and they, they are probably thinking about what they're doing. Now, people out here are, are trying what they can to, uh, to sort of uh, shield themselves or protect themselves, uh, their granaries and livestock and things like that. In this picture, you can see the thin metal sheets sort of uh, laid against the wall. Um, now, this is something what uh, most of the people are doing. What happens is, or uh, uh, what they say is, uh, when the bear tries to come and try to break, tries to break into the homes, if it starts clawing at the at these thin metal sheets, it's going to make a lot of noise, and that is going to work as their own indigenous alarming system. So it makes noise, and people get to know there's bear, so they just uh, wake up, they 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 sort of come out flash torch lights and um, beat metal tins, make a lot of noise and the uh, sort of uh, that drives the bears away. So that's one of their local methods. Um, if you see to the, the so the, there's the top left, you can see a yellow spot around here. We have put one deterrent light here. I'll tell you more about the deterrent light as well. Um, but yeah. Seeing, so trying to tell you what else people do. Now, this is another example of what people say. Uh, they, they thought of fighting the bear strength to strength. So it's a strong animal. Uh, a male bear could go anywhere around 200, 250 kilos and stand up to five and a half, six feet. So it's a strong animal. So they sort of, let me show you a side angle of this picture. They sort of put up this metal uh, rod, which were... And these rods were cut slant to make it work like a spike, hoping that the bear, when it comes and tries to push through or hold onto it, it might just uh, get, it might deter, it might get, you know, these metal uh, extrusions could poke the bear's palms and may maybe discourage the bear from uh, attempting to get inside the house. But if you see the, uh, there were, Clearly a flaw of the design that bears are very intelligent animals and they are problem solvers. Now, this entire frame gives a lot of room for a good hand grip. And that's what the bear figured out. And it just from the other window, it just started ripping open these, these metal spike frames. So, yeah, so it's, it's quite tricky. I mean, instead of... Uh, dealing with uh, uh, the strength against strength or well, we we've understood we have to find out other ways to deter the bears or discourage the bears from coming into the uh, village and, and uh, sort of get human food because that that sort of gives a it sort of creates a long term issue uh, it's called food conditioning I and mean, once of bears of food condition then uh, it's very difficult to uh, sort of teach them not to come back uh, because it's the easiest source of food. And then why wouldn't a bear come into the homes of people and take what it needs? So there's a lot of work that's going on uh, uh, in this region to understand and do what we can to discourage the bears from coming into the village and sort of understand what's happening in their landscape as well. This is another uh, thing that one of the local villager uh, tried out. Now, this is uh, the door of a livestock pen. He has about 15, 20 sheep and goat, and that's the door that he uh, sort of nailed these nails on. So thinking if the bear tries to break open, it's going to get pricked by the nails and it's going to think it's a bad idea and go away. But somehow the bear found a, uh, a easy spot and and if you can see the right hand side, they, this entire thing has chipped off 
a bear broke into the pen, uh, killed one sheep, uh, and the rest of the sheep just ran away. And uh, yeah, so so bears are known to be very intelligent, right? Probably not as intelligent as uh, the primates, but they're known to be problem solvers. They have figured out uh, a lot of ways to get to their food source or, or just uh, solve their challenges. I mean, uh, to be very specific, I, I also have a feeling that bears are very aware about of their surrounding, as in what's out there. If, if a bear has to see or encounter something that's just... Uh, doesn't fit in the landscape, it is going to try and investigate or something's not right. For example, we set up a camera trap in one of the valleys. It was quite well hidden. And uh, and uh, the very second day, the bear uh, saw the camera trap and then it just took it out from the pile of rocks and just tossed it around, broke it. And that's it. I don't know if so any of you have seen this video of uh, the the OCD bear. I don't know from where this one is, but it's very interesting. It's been doing rounds on social media lately, and uh, this is this is a sequence I've captured as a screenshot. There, it's it's you can see that road marker uh, lying uh, slant on the road, the red color one. Uh, easier way to explain the VLC logo. Yeah, that's the one. <laughs> And uh, so the bear comes walking. It sees that uh, the road marker line. It picks it up, puts it upright, and walks away. Now, now, if you have to see this sequence, why would the bear do that? Was it just an accident? Maybe it is. Well, did it purposely want to do it? We don't know. It was definitely not trying to figure out what that element is. Because when I see the video, it went there. Like, in a second, it put that road marker uh, upright and just walked away. So it was definitely not interested in playing or discovering. Probably it knew what it it is supposed to do or probably not. It's just a chance. We don't know. So what I'm trying to say is not that bears want to see a road sign upright. All I'm trying to say is they are well aware about their surroundings and they love to interact with uh, what's uh, or surrounding them, and uh, yeah, so that's 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 another interesting photo. This is a picture of a bear or when it uh, it sort of uh, went into the home uh, in a ha to get inside the house. It tried to sort of uh, get inside the house, but it could not. So it climbed on top of the roof. This is a picture of the roof. It found a soft spot. There was a chimney that was coming. It's a thin metal chimney. And that's it. It knew that's the way it should probably try to get inside. So it carefully removed the entire chimney and the lid around it and tried to get inside. Obviously, uh, it, it, it sort of it uses my brain to understand how to get in. So there's this interesting thing about using tools uh, by the bears. The, uh, so uh, there are good amount of research researchers who are studying this as well. Um, now, I right now forget where exactly where this study was done, but in captive bears, it's been known that the bears use tools to solve the problem. So in one of the captive enclosure, bear enclosure, uh, so researchers had uh, hung food on top, which is out well away from the bear's reach. And uh, they wanted to see what the bear does. And there were a lot of props kept around. Uh, in the enclosure, what the bear, one of the bears did was it figured out it it sort of dragged a tree stump, put it as a platform, and climbed on that to get to the food. Now this is something we hear about in Zanskar. There were two incidents that I have heard about people saying a bear once entered the enclosure of a sheep, well, a goat and sheep. It killed one sheep, and there was a commotion. People woke up, and now the bear wanted to run out of the enclosure. And uh, uh, it just could not climb out. And what it did was it started grabbing one sheep after the other and started piling them one about the other to get out of the enclosure, to use them as a ladder. <laughs> that was fascinating. And this has happened twice uh, reported by people in Zaskar. So I have uh, uh, no reason not to believe, but yeah, I mean, I would love to see something like this happening in front of me. 
so these bears are fascinating. They're intelligent. And what are they doing in the human villages? Uh, this is an important picture of uh, what happened in one of the villages that we went to. Uh, there's a constant that this is this particular site has been constantly raided by the bears. And uh, uh, our assumption is, yes, obviously you stock food in your homes and bear sense of smell is really good. It's seven times better than a, that of a bloodhound. It can smell food from miles away. So that's one attractive and then that is what is drawing the bears to the villages, right? And... Uh, so if, if, if the bears are coming into their homes tracking food, maybe we can look at odor proofing the food and things like that. But now there are many sites I have come across. For example, this picture is of a community hall, which is a little far from the general homes. It has absolutely no food stored. And there was no food stored at the time of attack. There was no food stored before uh, the attack. So there was um, probably no incentive for the bears to come and investigate this, but they did, right? So and so we probably can't just think linear fashion that bear senses smell great. So you know it's uh, it's accessing food through sense of smell. So hence we do A B C. No, we have to really spend a lot of time understanding what drives these bears. There are a lot of speculation why this would have happened. But, you know, you need to spend more time and study. So that's one of the interesting. And this is not just one incident. There are a lot of schools, uh, schools which do not have midday meal schemes. You, uh, if some of you understand, in India, uh, there's a midday meal scheme where uh, the schools store food items and uh, they they cook and feed the children during the lunch hours. Now that that can be a big attractant for the bears to the bears, and then and but but there are a lot of schools that do not follow that, and there was those schools attacked as well, uh, which did not have any triggers. So that is something, uh, you know, uh, I would like to understand why this is happening. There are some speculations, but yeah, till the time we study in depth, we we really wouldn't. So, Prathamish, am I okay on time? Hello? Prathamish? Hello, guys? Yeah, Hello? Continue, continue. All right, okay. Sorry, there was this airy silence. Right. And now... Uh, the first study that we carried out was to understand what exactly is happening uh, when these bears come into the village, what is driving them, and and and, and what what is the target? So there were well, we we met people in twenty villages, and we have recorded two hundred and sixty five incidents of bears coming into the village and attacking homes. Some were uh, incidents where the bears were attacking the livestock. Some were incidents where some incidents were about bears attacking the granaries and food sorry, stored in the kitchen. Uh, just to check if everyone's out here, how, what do you think the bears preferred most about, say, people who think bears mainly went for livestock type A, for people who think the bears attacked mainly the kitchen store type B? Let's see what the answers would be. Uh, you can put up the answers on the chart. On the chat, yeah. Okay, okay. Like a WhatsApp chat? Uh, no, no. You can see it right in front of your screen. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Um, someone... Hey, oh, hey, yeah. uh, I'm unable to see. Prathamesh, can you help me? Can you tell me? Okay. Okay. No worries. This is just to make sure everyone's around here. So, uh, we have mixed. Most of it, we started with B as an option. Then we yeah. have two A's. I can say three to four A's. Again, a lot of B's again. Uh, somebody wants you to repeat the question again. What do you think the bears targeted most? Do they go for livestock in the village or do they go for the food stored in kitchen stores and granaries? So the option A is? Option A is the livestock. Option B is the food grain. 
So yeah, we have maximum uh, B initially, then there's a lot of people who started A also. It's a big thing. Okay, like good. 50, 50. Yeah, that's right. So the uh, difficult. So what we found down, we also thought, um, initially we under probably thought the best road definitely go for livestock, but that was a major difference. 198 incidents of bears only targeting kitchen stores, and there were only 67 incidents of attack on livestock. Now, if I have to filter this out further, how many of the 67 incidents were successful attempts, which means the bear was able to eat the livestock? The success rate was really low because you know people would wake up and and uh, they would save the not save the life, uh, lifestyle, drive the bear away and the bears uh, were not able to eat. It. But yes, 198 incidents. Now this is this is very different from what is happening or what has been reported from the neighboring states in Himachal, Uttarakhand, uh, things like that. There, 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 the trend is exact opposite, if I may say. So there is a lot of livestock depredation. When I say depredation is the attack by attack on something by a wild animal. So uh, yeah, livestock depredation is high, and uh, there aren't many incidents of bears. So this is quite unique, probably in my opinion, based on what I've seen. So yeah, uh, so just to. Go with the slow. I mean, the, well, we try to find out, okay, so what was stored in these granaries and kitchen stores? Let's find that out. So we know there was rice, barley, wheat, butter, curd, uh, churpe. Churpe is a type of sweetened cheese that's, that, that's, that the locals make. Uh, then dal, peas, oil, sugar, meat. Okay. Now, in all the incidents that all these items were present. What would you think? It's really difficult uh, to do the poll here. But what do you think? Give me the top one and the the, mo the most targeted item. So you can type whatever rice or meat or whatever you want. Okay, I'm seeing dal, wheat, butter, curd, wheat and barley. And churpe, good, sugar, <laughs> madhu, dal, wheat, sugar, barley. Okay, cool. Uh, thank, thank you for typing in your feed. Yes. Uh, okay, go on. It's still going on. Okay, I'll give you 30 more seconds if you have to type. Right. Yeah. Basically, Fe. Fe would be. Yeah. Arwa can answer that later. Uh, okay. So I'll just carry on. Uh, um, sugar was the most targeted. Okay. Then was chirpe. Then was rice. Then it was cut. The amount of time meat was targeted was negligible. Even when there were meat, there was meat stored, most of the time the bears went directly for sugar, if sugar was available in its raw form, or they went for churpe, which is also sweetened cheese, has got sugar. Then they went for rice. Okay, rice, as some of you might know, is a, it's it's a food item high high on glycemic index, which means when you consume rice, it turns into sugar very quickly. Then there was curd and butter and things like that. So that was very interesting find that uh, the bears were uh, after our high, uh, food items that were high in glycemic uh, rather than other. Now again, these, if you see between say spring, summer, autumn, most of the incidents take place in autumn where the bears have to consume more calories. So uh, clearly when they want to consume so 2,000 kilocalories per day, uh, sugar seems like a good option for me. And uh, 
So so that's it. But it's it's interesting. How did they figure out that? Or they were just trying, or maybe they did not. These are again very very uh, broad speculation. Uh, we still need to sort of investigate much more in detail. But that's an eye opener. Also, if you look at the the attacks and number of attacks on granary and livestock enclosure, uh, the energy spent to bring down an animal, then energy versus the energy spent on just breaking a window and stealing, uh, say, sugar, rice, or churpe, it's much less. So they're also trying, I don't know, probably that sounds more energy efficient thing to do. Uh, but uh, yeah, we are hoping to sort of understand all these various things um, of the bear behavior. That's, that's you know, I'm trying to come back to the, the title of the presenter, which is why I find this bear so fascinating, fascinating bears of uh, the dark. So we're trying to do what we can. Initially, obviously, the first step is to sort of uh, help the community uh, reduce their losses because uh, any kind of uh, conservation needs community involvement, their participation. Without uh, community participation, there's no conservation that actually takes place. So, uh, so say in 2017 or 17, 18, we... We uh, did a big crowdfunding campaign and raised funds to get these uh, deterrent lights, fox lights. Now, these lights are are very effective in keeping uh, big cats and uh, the ursids away, as said by the manufacturer. And it works well. Uh, it, has a, it has a sort of a, a computerized uh, flashes of these colored lights. It has a red, blue, and white light. Red works very well with the cats. Cats see red very well. And uh, the bears and the dog species see blue very well. So it, it, it's sort of working very it's well. So we weren't really sure about these lights initially. Uh, so we thought, it to, uh, we thought we should try. And it's been two years. Every site that we have installed these lights, the bears have not come back. I mean, they've been around the area, but they have not come back to the same site. Uh, so clearly it's working. We do not know how long this will work because clearly uh, bears are intelligent, as we understand, and they sooner or later will figure out and uh, have their way around. So we, we don't know yet. Again, this is under general assumption. So these worked very well, and uh, the people are very happy. Now, apart, apart from uh, that, this is what we did last year. This is... Uh, so one of the study uh, done in the in the, in the in northern American region is is when uh, is use of uh, bear proof uh, uh, garbage cans, and when when access to a food item is restricted, the bears learn over time not to spend energy trying to get that particular item. So in one study, they've shown that the a 60% reduction in bear uh, incidents where they have used uh, things like bear-proof um, uh, garbage cans. So we designed a, a bear-proof food storage container here. Again, our learning from previous uh, study is that you can't uh, sort of uh, offset, you uh, know, uh, strength to strength. If the bear can tackle 100 kilograms of this, we put up uh, 150 kilograms of uh, obstacle in, in front of them. No, that will that, that's not going to work. You have to work around what are their limitations. So here, uh, this is uh, this this particular. Uh, so you have to, so understanding how the bears access these food uh, storage containers. They, they sort of push around and bang. They jump on it. They 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 try to break it open. They try to access locks. Okay, so the lot of bears know how to access locks. And I'm not talking about Hamilton brown bear. If we again reflect back to the studies in Europe and America, there are a lot of bears that have figured out how to open the 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 the, the, the door locks and locks and uh, okay, I can hear an echo of myself. Sorry, and the car locks. So here is the, this particular uh, the container has a a slot. Inside that is another locking mechanism, which can be opened by only human hands engaging two fingers. Now, that's something that's a limitation for the bear. Uh, so, yeah, we've done that. And uh, 
we have worked with the communities as well. And uh, uh, yeah, so we try to interact with communities and sort of tell them what needs to be done, we, why the bears are important, engage them in the process. We also have uh, had a lot of uh, consultation with people. There have been incidents where we have got to know of uh, of some 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 community trying they, they were planning to retaliate and take action uh, which would harm the bear and fortunately we made it in time and we were able to talk to the people and then uh, we promised to help them with a lot of bear proofing uh, uh, techniques for their homes in return they promised not to harm any predators so that has been one of the working principles of snow leopard conservancy we help a lot of people but then again in return we want an assurance from them saying that they will not harm the wildlife. So that's one of the things. We have also interacted with, uh, I mean, we also explored the religious angle and uh, sort of build nature cult culture uh, um, relationship in people when people do understand uh, the significance of animals in, in, in the landscape and religion plays an important role. So we, we have involved a lot of monks and uh, important religious people in sort of spreading around in why bears are important to this region. Now, again, uh, <clears throat> so that's, that's another part. And then we're still studying the bears. We're still understanding how the bears live in this harsh uh, environment. Apart from just the bears, there is an interaction. What is the interaction with these bears with other predators? And so this region has the, 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 the snow leopard, the, the Tibetan wolf, and uh, the brown bear itself, how are they interacting? Now, this particular uh, valley in Zanskar, uh, there we know of the bear movement around this area. And uh, we also had heard about other animals. So we set up a camera trap to see, um, see what sort of animals live here and what sort of habitat use. Is, is, this, um, is this sort of uh, frequented by different uh, predators? And yeah, one of the camera trap photos shows us the bear one night. And a few hours later, we have a snow leopard, female snow leopard going out and two male cubs following her. So that's another interesting thing I want. Uh, we want to study again. How is this uh, habitat used by multiple predators? Uh, so the snow leopards, the brown bear, the wolves, how are they interacting with, e with each other? One of the villages we know of where uh, the, the villages reported of bears breaking into livestock enclosure and attacking sheep and goat. Um, there was, uh, um, we asked like, so what, who, who, did you see the bear? Because we, we're not sure, we wanted to make sure they saw a bear that was attacked so we don't blame the wrong animal for it. She said, yes, there was a bear and the wolves. So I don't know, in wild, uh, the wolves would sort of wolves are capable of overpowering snow leopard and steal the kills. Now here as well, uh, probably the wolves interact in a similar manner with the bears. Would the wolves try to steal the bear kill, or the bear is trying to take away the wolf's kill? And there's this is something that's very interesting. And these kind of relationships are very complex. Uh, uh, need to be studied, investigated further. Um, so just one last thing, if I had to tease you, another, these are fascinating things. Now, if you look at this picture, and now there are two uh, great inferences from two different researchers put out there, which I came across, and um, I see that's a fair point. Like uh, one of the researcher who is studying the Himalayan brown bear and the Tibetan brown bear says Zanskar would be one habitat where both the Hemlin brown bear and the Tibetan brown bear would sort of merge. Dr. Bipin Rathod, again in Himachal, has seen some bears which have got sort of narrow snout, which sort of is an indicator of a different species, could be a, a Tibetan brown bear. So now this is not, I'm not trying to say that there are bears here, but that's what's, that's what's making this exciting. Again, something to tease any researchers out there who would want to find out, are there two different species interacting here, two different bear species? Now, if you see this, 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 I don't know if I have, I'm going to call this a brown bear or a Tibetan brown bear, 
I'm just probably it's best to leave it out there for people to uh, sort of uh, give their views on and any researcher trying to or willing to take this up further. Again, none of this can be possible without money, and we have uh, you know have our own challenges. Well, I have been trying to uh, sort of pitch for crowdsourcing so that more and more people are uh, interacting and involved in this. And uh, this year, uh, unfortunately, we were not able to reach our target, but that has not left us uh, disheartened. We are still going to carry out a lot of work. Um, and uh, if, so I would just like to put out an appeal here. Anyone would like to help, uh, we will appreciate any kind of help that we can Put it out. So details could be sent to you guys later. And uh, yeah, I will cut this here. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pratamesh. Thank you, Birds of Sane and Raika District for letting me interact with the general populace, something that we want to do for a very long time. People who want to know more about the work that's happening for more instant updates, you can follow the Instagram page. Uh, and you can also look at our website, the Snow Leopard India .org. Uh, That's the organization website. Thank you very much. I would take some questions now. Yes, Kevin, thanks. Just a second.